Welcome back to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio. And joining us now from Hillsdale College, Professor of Economics and Public Policy, uh, Gary Wolfram. Uh, Professor Wolfram, welcome back to Freedom and Prosperity Radio. How are you doing, sir? Oh, great. Thank you for having me on again. You know, I, I, I dream wistfully of an era when public policy and economics don't have to be wound together into one syllabus. Because <laughs> it's, I think it was way, there's way too much public policy and way too little economics. Economics. Have you found the same thing? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, what um, sort of interesting, I always use the example of uh, this, um, uh, the uh, scarlet, uh, what's it called? Now I can't remember. Uh, you know what letter? happens? Um, I tell my students, um, names and nouns are the first to go. <laughs> um, but uh, so what happens is uh, the problem with you, Watson, is that you see but you don't observe. Uh-huh. That's what Sherlock Holmes says in, um, I can't remember, it's the name, it's the first, oh, the, uh, it's the very first uh, article that he that he wrote. Yeah, uh, it's short a, a story study, that he wrote. study in Scarlet or something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah something yeah, like right. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we want to talk about the tax bill. This is our second week in a row on this uh, and the the dueling tax proposals. But uh, I guess the first and foremost... Given the number of people that seem upset about the tax bill, uh, I'm wondering if that's a good sign for tax reform is because I hear the the folks on the left screaming that it's a tax break for the rich. And then I hear rich people who I you know, are yelling at me saying, "How? what happened to my tax cut? So I don't know who is getting uh, the short end of the stick. Is anyone in this, Professor Wolfram? Well, you know, I think we need to focus on the overall picture, which is not who's getting the tax break in some sense. I mean, realistically, um, if you look at it, the uh, what is the effect of the tax is what we really ought to be looking at. And so if we look at the corporate income tax, for example, we're going to cut the corporate income tax or the proposal is to cut the corporate income tax from one of the highest, really the highest in, in the industrialized world, to about the middle of where the other countries are. Now, what that does is that changes the all sorts of incentives because let's say that you were going to build a factory um, and uh, you you know you were going to earn uh, you know 100 million dollars on that factory, uh, and, and what's going to happen is it's going to cost you you know 90 million dollars to produce it. Or, you know, to you know build produce it. with the stuff, yeah. So that so you got 10 million dollars in profit. Okay, so it works. But if let's say what happens is that your profit gets taxed away, um, let's say $0.35 cents on every dollar gets taxed away, then that thing might not become profitable anymore. There might be something else that you could do with your money. And that's, what's, that, that's really what's going on is that we've got to realize that this hefty corporate income tax is causing all sorts of incentives that make it so that we don't invest. In fact, from an an economic standpoint, and from an economic standpoint, investment means new machinery, Mm -hmm. new factories, you know, things that produce other goods and services. And if you actually look at the data, you'll see that one of the things that's kept our economy growing at what a friend of mine, Brian Westbury, calls a plow horse economy instead of a racehorse economy (laughs) um, has been that it's private investment, the group was called gross private investment, has been lagging. And, of course, when that happens... When there's less machinery and computers and everything else, then labor productivity is less than it would be. Mm -hmm. So then you look at the data and you say, oh, my gosh, we haven't had a really strong growth in labor productivity. So what happens then is wages don't grow very fast. Right. So if you sort of think through it, a high corporate income tax rate does what? It makes it so that wages are lower than they otherwise would be. Well, and, and that's a great point because as you were describing, the, you know, using the analogy of the uh, factory, I was thinking, well, and then that factory, out of that $90 million of the cost of manufacturing, there's a lot of wages in that that people earn and then go and buy the products made in the factory, increasing its prof- profitability and perhaps even increasing its overall revenue uh, and then increasing the number of employees that are needed uh, and also at the same time decreasing the pressure on social programs to help pay for uh, rent or school 
tuitions, things like that, that a lot of folks are pointing at the tax reform and saying, well, hold on, I'm going to lose deductibility for X, Y, or Z, especially, I guess, the hot button right now is uh, college tuition uh, deductibility. Uh, so why would I go to college if I can't deduct the tuition, although I can't imagine how many people actually go to college so they can deduct college tuition, but I guess there's uh, whatever the rhetoric is. But but the the, the spider webbing effect of, of more jobs, more people working, more people making more money uh, offsets as the, the left tries to demonize how do we pay for these tax cuts, um, that that's where it comes from. Well, you got a couple of things in, in, in that. In, in, uh, one is that when you raise the standard deduction, and what happens is all these deductions that you're losing, you're not going to use them anyway. So, when, you know, when they say, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to lose the deduction on uh, state and local income tax, okay? Um, or it, it, what, you wouldn't be using that deduction anyway because mm-hmm. by increasing the standard deduction, you're moving us towards a flat rate income tax, which is the flat tax is a much better way of oh, yeah. taxing us. It's, it's more uh, transparent. Mm-hmm. It's easier. And you lower the marginal tax rate. So what happens is, if what happens is if I have an 80% marginal tax rate and I give you deduction for uh, buying a solar car, solar-powered car, that car now costs only 20 cents the way it, uh, because 80 cents gets given off in your tax break, right? Right. So, but if I lower the marginal tax rate, then telling you, oh, I'm going to give you this benefit of buying the solar car that doesn't have nearly the strength as it does when I got an 80% tax rate. So people who want government to intervene in the economy and to tell you, here's what you should buy, if you buy this, you get to deduct it. If you do this, we will give you a credit, whatever those are. When you have high marginal tax rates, the deductions have a much greater effect. So if you are a believer in freedom, you what you would want is – Low marginal tax rates, but a broad base. I don't have the government telling me mm-hmm. deduction for this, deduction for that. You know, what if I think I would rather rent, right? Maybe I would rather rent because uh, if something happens, I can change my job more quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. I can move somewhere else to get a better job, whatever. I don't have to worry about, oh, now i got to sell my house and I'm underwater and all this other stuff. So what the government's been doing is giving you a deduction for your mortgage interest paid, and the property taxes that you pay on your house. They don't give you a deduction for your rent paid. So what government is doing has been saying, we think, as government, it's better for you to buy a house than to rent a house. And if the marginal tax rates fall, then we can get rid of all these deductions that are really just government directing you Mm -hmm. to do this, that, or the other thing. Why should the government tell me it's better for me to buy a house and to rent, or it's better for me um, to, you know, do this, that, or the other thing. If I, you know, you get a deduction if you put, a, you know, a, um, a special kind of water heater, right? Right. Yeah, you know, absolutely. you get some credit for that, right? Or you get a credit for putting solar panels on your on or deductions. Redo me. all your windows or yeah. something like that. So, yeah. So yeah. why should the government be telling me to do that? We're much better off with a broader base, lower rates, and that's. That's where this thing is moving us. Now, is it perfect? No. Are some people going to get worse off? Yeah, because they bought the house, right? But this increase in the standard deduction has just been ignored when they start talking about getting rid of this deduction or that deduction. You're not going to use it because the standard deduction has increased. Professor Gary Wolfram, uh, professor of economics and public policy at Hillsdale College, talking about the House and Senate uh, tax reform plans. Uh, And you were talking about simplifying and getting it uh, easier for everyone to kind of grasp what it is uh, and where it is. It also puts the onus back on uh, groups, especially you you, you hear even – arch conservatives like Daryl Issa saying, well, I had to vote against it because my district is in California and my constituents are going to get hit hard by this. But doesn't that subsidize states like California or New York with exorbitant 
tax rates um, just to allow them to say, oh, well, yeah, we have high taxes. Or you mentioned property taxes before as well. Oh, yeah, you got high property taxes, but you know what? You can write those off your taxes if you itemize. Um, It it, it subsidizes that behavior, and it's not the government saying we're going to raise your taxes. It's just saying go get your state legislator to lower your tax rate locally. Yeah, you're exactly right. This is an exact example that says we will, we, the, 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 the government of the United States is going to say we would prefer your local unit of government or your state government to have higher taxes. And how can we do that? We can make it so that all the rest of the taxpayers will pay higher taxes to raise the same amount of revenue because you're now going to pay lower taxes because your state government has raised taxes. Mm-hmm. You want to have the price of state taxes be transparent to people. And, and again, part of this is, yes, some of your constituents are going to face that, but, again, we keep, we've got to keep coming back to when the standard deduction goes up, you won't even be using that. Mm-hmm. And that's what we want. Yeah. We, we would rather have it that the federal government is not telling you it's better to be in a state with high taxes or it's better to have solar power on your you know, roof or it's better to have this kind of car or, you yeah. know, whatever. Watch public television or whatever it is we want to right, incentivize. Right. And on top of that, you know, when people talk about, oh, the rich are going are, are gonna to get a tax cut, but the top 1% of income earners, right, they earn 19% of total income, but they pay 38% of all the income taxes. Yep. Oh, so yeah. if we mm-hmm. lower the income tax, you're going to have to lower some of it because on the, on the top 1% because they're paying 38% of the taxes. But they're also the ones who are more likely going to be investing in a startup or a, or even a, in a venture capital firm that's then finding those startup ideas or those factories that want to get built. And, and to start, I was just reading about uh, Mahindra, uh, and many of our listeners here, you know, w- one of the notable national talk show hosts is sponsored by Mahindra and its its uh, tractors and, and ATVs, but they're apparently a very big SUV manufacturer in the subcontinent, uh, and they're building a huge factory in Dearborn, Michigan. Well, well, what's that? You know, there's there's jobs coming back to Michigan. That that's the kind of thing you want to hear. Oh, sure. I mean, and and also we need to have more startups, and we need to. We've had a real reduction in the number of startups, mm-hmm. that, you know, which are the small companies that that are really form the foundation for our uh, employment. And one way to do that is to lower the rate that a that individuals have to pay. What, what, what people don't think about is this top 1% that they're looking at. Mm-hmm. A lot of that is a small business because if, you know, if, it's, if Gary Wolfram owns his own business, how does that get taxed? That gets taxed through the personal income tax. Right. Or yeah. if you're a partnership, it gets taxed through the personal income tax. Unless you're a C corporation, you don't pay the corporate income tax. You pay the individual income tax. So if I have a business that earned, you know, I start a startup and I'm doing really well and, you know, now I'm making, you know, a million dollars this year, um, 40% of that's going to go off to the federal government. And so what's my incentive to have this startup working? You know, right. it, it, by, by lowering these marginal tax rates, that's what's important. And part of that is in this plan. You know what they talk about pass through, you know, companies yeah. S Corp and you know, with their yes, S Corps for sole proprietorships, um, partnerships, LLC. LLCs. You want to encourage these things to grow. And the way that you encourage them to grow is to not tax away forty percent of everything that they make. Is there a, a subtext, and we were talking about the uh, the S corps, the small, the the little, the startups, and that's where I've always felt that American innovation came from as well. The the new idea, the the thing that challenges the big guy because you know they've they've gr- grown perhaps too big or or they've not innovated fast enough, and the customers wanted new innovations or, or would reward for new innovations, uh, that sort of stagnated our economy as well, is that we just sort of crank out the same cars, we crank out the same TV sets. You know, there's not as much innovation. But then you look at a, a, comp- a business like the telephone industry, uh, you know, they're innovating every couple of months. There's a new iPhone, what, they're up to, to 33 now, and, and the Motorola X, X29. And, and, but it, the phone business seems to be innovating more than anyone else. But most of these companies, they, they seem to have grown stagnant in this lack of competition. 
Well, but it's what it really is is it's all you know. Economics is all not all about, but it's to observe that. I think that's the key, mm-hmm. and to observe incentives. People respond to incentives. I mean, that's fundamentally that's what you need to think about. People respond to incentives, and so if what happens is I give you an incentive to produce something new, in that you're going to earn a profit by doing that you're much more likely to do it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I use the example um, in my class, I use the example of Beauty and the Beast. In the movie, Beauty's father is a tinker, right? He makes this wood chop, probably maybe a while since you saw the movie, but, you know, (laughs) his father, uh, her father makes this thing that chops wood, and he's clearly doing it just because he likes to be a tinker. And you will have that. You will have occasional uh, innovation. But if you're talking about systematic innovation, Systematic innovation has to have a greater incentive. I need because because all innovation is a risk. You, do, no. I, you know. Also, to, I, I I tell my students, look under um, uh, in the Bible it says, "Do unto others as you would have them do unto you." In a market economy, that's not good enough. You got to do unto others things they don't even know they want done unto them yet. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know, I got to figure out. Hey. This, you know, Gary Wolfram is going to want this brand new whatever it is, um, and he doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to take on a risk. I'm going to invest money. I'm mm-hmm. going to hire people. I'm going to produce prototypes. I'm going to market the thing, and hopefully he'll be willing to pay enough for it to offset all those right. costs. And and that's what you have to figure out. And that's what makes it such an exciting, vibrant economy when you do that. What what about taking the power away from the federal government and even the state government if they can follow suit? But uh, when the IRS doesn't have as much authority to you know permit you know this. Uh, license that license from uh, tax-exempt status. We just go through the case of Lois Lerner and the uh, 501c3s that she was dragging her heels on to keep them from doing it. Uh, it, it, If you weaken the IRS's authority over the economy, you also weaken its authority over the rest of our society and its public policy. Is that a fair thing to say, Professor Wolfram? Well, yeah. I mean, if if, if I can reduce the marginal tax rates so that they're only taking a smaller, you know, they're taking a smaller fraction out of each next new dollar that I earn, and I make it so that everybody's pretty well taxed the same. We're taxed for, you know, uh, no matter where our income's earned from, uh, we don't get special treatment if we do this, that, or the other thing the government wants us to do, then we're all going to be more free. And it won't matter so much um, what the IRS does, because it'll be simple. Transparency. When the IRS, when there's thousands and thousands of pages of rules, the IRS has a lot of power over you, oh, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because even if, even if they're not correct, you still got to pay somebody to help you in court to fight whatever's going on. Mm-hmm. And so by, you know, what that's, you know, what have I, I any Actually, public finance textbooks going to say this. You know, lowering the marginal tax rate and increasing the base. I keep coming back to that, but that is fundamentally what we should be trying to do. And when you look at a tax bill, you should be saying, "Okay, is this moving us towards that or moving us away from that?" Well, and 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 when you have less, uh, when you have less complicated tax law, then you got less authority of individual mm. IRS people to come in and do things uh, that affect what you're going to do. And there's also the cost of compliance, which is sort of the sure. passive-aggressive tax that uh, then all these businesses, oh, well, you know, it, it, sure, it's 35 percent, but that tack another 5 or 7 percent on for all the cost of compliance. Sure. I mean, I, just, I mean, think about doing your own taxes just individually, individually doing your own taxes. Most people uh, don't just sit down and do their taxes. At, the, at, at best, they use some sort of computer program, yeah. um, and a lot of it you have to turn it over to somebody mm-hmm. um, because it's just too darn complicated. And, and again, that, that gives power to your government to do things, and it also um, affects your behavior. And innovation... It affects innovation because I don't really know what the rules of the game are. And, true, and, true, and, and yeah. what you really need to do is just observe today how many things you use today that did not exist in 1950. That's Ooh. why we're wealthy. It's through innovation. 
And we increase innovation when we reduce the marginal tax rate, the, the tax on the extra dollar of, of mm-hmm. either profit if it's a corporation or income if it's an individual. Well, you can find them at hillsdale.edu, correct, uh, Professor Wolfram? Uh, that's my email. Yeah. Actually, you can follow me on Twitter. Okay. Um, it's Gary underscore Wolfram. And the name of the uh, story was Scandal in Bohemia. I, I want to thank you for joining us this holiday week, Scandal in Bohemia. Follow it. We'll put it up on our social media platforms as well. But I hope you have a wonderful remainder of this uh, Thanksgiving weekend, and thank you for taking some time out with us. Well, thank you for having me. I hope you have had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday weekend and are ramping up to an amazing Christmas season as well for all of us here. We are thankful for your listenership and your membership at the Virginia Institute for Public Policy. So long and thanks for all the fish.